The Lord be with you. I hope you'll join me in turning in your copy of Holy Scripture to, as the sermon title suggests, the one everybody knows, Psalm 23. <coughs> Excuse me. Listen now for the word of the Lord in the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Holy God, in this time now, we ask that you speak to us from the words of Scripture. Words, God, that move us, call us to deep concern and action. God, may you speak to us in ways that is clear, ways that are clear that you are the one who is speaking, that we may hear your words while whatever words I seem to put in the way will be forgotten. So Holy Spirit, speak to us now, we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, as most of you know, I spent the better part of last week uh, down in southeast Alabama with my family in the wake of my stepmother's death and her funeral. And as a minister, I've done... I think around 40 funerals, and maybe 40 I know in the last five or six years, uh, probably gone to a lot more than that. Um, but I've never been on both sides before, like I was last week. It's a bit odd, I have to tell you, the timing of death in our culture, it's, it's odd. My stepmom Paula passed away Wednesday morning in her sleep sometime around six, let me think. Dad called me around 8. I got over to his house about 8.30. A nurse came at about 9, checked for vitals to give the official word. Family sort of trickled in, but about an hour or so later, two men in overly starched shirts came from the funeral home in a van to do what they needed to do. We called the family in, talked about what would happen. Dad sort of, if there had been a microphone, passed it off to me. He's like, you're the one that does this for a living, talk to them. And we decided that we'd meet Dad and I at the funeral home at 2, the same day, just a couple of hours later. We got there at 1.30. Dad was understandably in a bit of a hurry. I remember we were sitting uh, at a conference table, me, him, the funeral director, and there was that odd point where they said, we'd like to take you into the showroom now. It's weird. It's weird. The showroom. If you've been there, you know what's in the showroom. You walk around, and what's really odd is when you see the price of things in the showroom. But Dad picked one out he wanted, and then there were other things to pick out. I didn't know this. There are packages. What, what, how would you like the guest book to be bound? What? I didn't even know people took those home. I've never seen one on display in anybody's house. You got to pick out the cards. This one came with thank you cards. Cersei's down in Enterprise does something odd. The entire time we were doing it, you could smell a ham cooking. They prepare a ham for the family the same day. Threw me off a little bit at first. Wasn't expecting to walk in and smell like honey glaze or something like that. And then I remember we were sitting down at the table. Dad had to sign a few more papers. I had to look over a few more things. Dad likes to play dumb in times like that as if he can't read passes them over to me. 
And the funeral director said, oh, one more thing, one more thing. On the back of the, the funeral programs, the little pieces of paper you get that are folded over, you have a picture of flowers or a dove or something on it. He said, on the back of those, is there any scripture you'd like to have? Anything at all? And Dad looked over at me and just sort of did like this. He said, we usually put the 23rd Psalm. I said, oh, that's fine. That's the one everybody knows. It is. Now, I said that knowing full well I had titled this sermon that like months ago. It's true. It's the one everybody knows. If you've been to Graveside over here in the cemetery when I've done it, you know it's the one I say every time. Every time we gather around that hole, it's the 23rd Psalm, usually in the old King James. It's the one everybody knows. I'll go to say it, and it doesn't take long before people start chiming in. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. I think I know the rest, but I'm going to stop right there in case I forget. That's what happens. Everybody knows it. It's odd the places you'll see it. You could be sitting in the waiting room at the doctor's office, look up on the wall. What's that? Some painting from Hobby Lobby. There it is, it's written, the 23rd Psalm. I'll tell you the strangest place I've probably ever seen it was eating at a restaurant. The waitress came by, gave us our silverware in a paper sleeve. Do you know what was printed on the back of the paper sleeve? The 23rd Psalm. There it was. Even people who don't go uh, to church, don't call themselves church folks, if you say, can you complete the sentence, the Lord is my, they're going to say what? Shepherd. It's the one everybody knows. I would, if I were a betting man, I would put good money on it that it's the most known passage of all of Scripture. Beating out John 3.16 by a mile, I'd bet. The 23rd Psalm. In fact, in my family, one of the, I mean, I'm probably the one who's most likely to go to church. I hope that's obvious. But there are some who are a little less likely than others. One of them, in his house, on the coffee table is a Bible, I think he picks it up to dust under it every once in a while. On the wall, though, big, wide painting. There's Jesus in his little blue and red get-up, his hair freshly shampooed and conditioned, sitting in a field, softest field you've ever seen, holding a little lamb in his lap. Do you know what it says out next to it? The Lord is my shepherd. It's the one everybody knows. But, you know, it's kind of odd. When you think about it, Jesus never quotes it. Paul never quotes it. If it's mentioned by the early church fathers, it's just in the same sort of breath as any of the other psalms. Why is it the one everybody knows? I think, I think the, the language of the King James has a little bit to do with it. It's, uh, when you read it in that translation, it almost reads like the lyrics of a song. But I wonder still why. Well, to read it, to read it upon closer inspection, I really wonder why more. You see, when you're so familiar with something, you can overlook the the details. You can overlook what something actually says, what something really is right there in front of you. It makes me think uh, of, of a time I was riding in the car with a friend, and he said, have you ever noticed the arrow in the FedEx logo? What? No, it just says FedEx. Now you're going to see it. It's between the E and the X. There's an arrow. I can't unsee it now. But he pointed it out once. You get so familiar with things, you overlook what's there right in front of your face. I think that about the 23rd Psalm. Just listen to it again. The Lord is my shepherd. Now, every time I've read that before, do you know how I've read it? Almost as if if David was telling us who his congressman was. The Lord, yeah, the Lord is my shepherd. No, no, no. That's a statement of ownership. That's a claim to be made. Yahweh is my shepherd. The one who is in the midst of all this junk with me. The one who's walking through the meadow, walking through the pasture, walking through, as he says later, the deep, dark valley with me. Not a king removed and remote on a throne. Not someone who who sits in the air-conditioned cab of the truck while the rest of them do the hard work. No, no, this is the shepherd in the midst of the sheep. I shall not want. 
You know, I have to be honest with you, of all the words in Psalm 23, that may be the one that I believe the least. I believe it the least because my life sort of reflects it the least. Really. It wouldn't take much. All you'd have to do is look at my Amazon account. You'll know. I shall not want. No, I shall want a bunch. It's there. It doesn't matter. There are books I'll never have a chance to read, never have time to read, but they're there. Gadgets I don't even know how to use, but they look cool. It's there. Every so often I get an itch. I start looking. I wonder how much motorcycles cost. Start looking. Every so often somebody got a Chevelle for sale somewhere. I'd really like to have one in the garage. I want. And some say, well, no, that's not what he meant. What he means is you won't need anything. And they quote those words from Jesus. Look at, the, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, but your Father provides for them. Look at the lilies of their field. Even Solomon in all of his glory was not decked out in the splendor that they are. And are you not more than the lilies? That's what Jesus said. And I believe that's true. God, God provides for our needs. But I think that word is about contentment. I shall not want. I just don't, I don't know. It may be the most, the one everybody knows, but I don't know if we really know that one. I think the next verse really plays into that. He makes me lie down in green pastures, leads me beside the restful waters, is what it says in Hebrew. He restores my soul. I want you to think about something for just a minute. When was the last time you really took a day off? Why don't you think about it? Now, I don't mean on a vacation day. When was the last time you really took a day off? I don't, mean, I don't mean a day you took off to go home and cut the grass. I don't mean a day when you piddled around the house. I don't mean a day spent all day in the sun at the ball field. When was the last time you took a day off? I, can, I, I tell you, I have a hard time. I have a hard time remembering. But here it is. He makes me lie down. He makes me go by the restorative. He makes me. He restores my soul. You know, I, I had a, a, a friend of mine tell me one time, he said, all this hard work will kill you. I said, yeah. And he said, you know what else it does? It, it means you think you're better than God. Because, you know, when you open the book, the first thing it says is God created. And then on the seventh day, what did he do? Rest. God rests one day out of seven. You can't. You can't. But there it is. He tells us to rest. To rest. Leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Uh, now that one I thought, well, that's pretty self That sounds Bible-ish, right? That sounds biblical. But you know what it says? You know what it means? Who does the leading in these paths? Not me. Not you. God. And yet, who are we so quick to give the credit to when the role for righteousness is called? Me. Look what I did. And the psalmist says, no, no, no. He leads you in the paths of righteousness. Now, verse 4 may be the most poetic of all of them. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, it says, in the King James. And in most, most modern English translations have kept that. Maybe the, in the Hebrew there's some actually specific valley there, but some, some more other translations say, even though I walk through the darkest valley. I guess I sort of like the valley of the shadow of death. It sounds ominous. But even though, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? I'm brave? Why? Because, because I, I, I can turn the light on and see through the valley? Why? Well, I fear no evil. For thou art with me, the psalmist says. Why do we not fear? Because we got it all figured out? Because we're bigger, badder, braver, stronger? No. Because God is with us. I think that may be why it's the most well-known psalm, why it's the one everybody knows. If Psalm 23 reminds us of anything, it's the truth that God is with us, that God walks with us through the darkest valleys. 
So often I think our image is that God is up on the mountain saying, when you get through that, I'll see you on the other side. That sometimes we think that, well, well, we'll get through this, and then when we get on the other side, God will bless us. But if the psalm teaches us anything, if the cross teaches us anything, it's that Jesus, God, God's self, goes through the valley with us. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I tell you, growing up uh, with a grandma who liked to use the rod from a peach limb, there's no comfort uh, in, in that sort of rod. Uh, but I don't think that's what he means. I know, in fact, it's not what he means. When a shepherd carried a rod, it wasn't to beat the sheep. Some of us, I think, have in our mind the image of a God who likes to beat the sheep, to kick the sheep, to tell the sheep to get in line and knock them on the head when they do wrong, but that's not it. The rod's there to ward off the danger. The tigers, as Levi said. The staff is there to say, no, 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 too close, too close to the edge. Come on back, come on back over here. Get out of the water. They comfort me. Verse 5 is one that, that, that troubles me a bit. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I don't like that. Now, I, I guess you could be a little metaphorical and say, God's going to be with you so much you ain't got to be worried about him. You can just set a table. But what does a table say? What's a table but a place to sit down and sup together? God prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. The ones who seek to do me harm, I'm to pull the chair out and say, sit down and eat a bite with me. That's what God does? I don't know if I like that. Oh, walk with me through the valley of the shadow of death, but don't set a table in front of me and my enemies. You can set a table for me, a nice corner booth, just invite my friends, but not in front of my enemies. And yet here he does it. God, you prepare a table before me, even in the presence of my enemies. That God is so close and so near, and there's nothing to fear, that we can sit down and eat with those who even seek to kill us. You anoint my head with oil. A sign of blessing, a sign of the presence of God. Oil upon the head. God is there. My cup overflows. That may be the most countercultural sentence, a countercultural phrase in all of the 23rd Psalm. Because we live, friends, in a time when we are sold a lie. A lie that there isn't enough. A lie that there isn't enough to go around. That you've got to get yours or else somebody else will take it. It's a lie. We're told over and over again, it doesn't matter what it is. You can put any name on it, money. You can call it education, uh, health care, whatever political football you'd like to use there, anything else. There's not enough to go around. There's not enough food. We're running out of water. We're running out of this. There's not enough to go around. It's a lie. God has provided enough, more than enough. The problem is, and this is free, it's not even in the notes. The problem is some people are holding on to too much of it. God says, my cup, the psalmist says, but God, my cup overflows. God always provides enough. Always. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. You know, when I've read that before, I thought that sounded like, like two, two sort of, I don't know, servants. Following behind me. Oh, there's goodness and there's mercy. Here they come. They're, they're going to serve me as I go through life. Goodness and mercy. That's not what that means. Do you know why goodness and mercy follow somebody? Because it spills out of them. Goodness and mercy comes forth from us. That's what the psalmist says. That if I trust in this God who's near, it's not that I'll be showered with goodness and mercy. That it will come out from me. Follow after me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord, the psalmist says. I like the, the NRSVs better, my whole life long. It, it, it states really more what the psalmist means. I think especially in the, in the context of a funeral, that last line may be the one that wraps us up in comfort. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. And then sometimes we always put on there what? 
Amen. But when you think about it, particularly in the context of the psalmist, nobody lives in the temple. Nobody lives in the house of God. I had a preacher, uh, a friend, actually my home church uh, pastor, preacher. I remember one time he and I were talking. I think it was during the Sunday school hour. He said to me, he said, Chris, there are going to be a lot of these folks out here, a lot of these Christians, they're going to be disappointed when they get to heaven. I said, why is that? He said, oh, because if you don't like church, you ain't going to like heaven. He said, that's all it's going to be for eternity, just church. I remember I told him, I said, Brother Jerry, I don't think I'd lead with that. Because I'm going to tell you, I, I, I love what God calls me to do. I love y'all, but I don't want to be stuck in a place like this forever. I don't. Dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Do you know what it means? It's actually, it, it's a bit of a euphemism. The house of the Lord. It's used elsewhere in the Psalms, elsewhere in Hebrew literature, particularly in poetry. The house of the Lord means among the people of God. The nation, the territory, but most importantly, the people God. I will dwell among the people of God my whole life long. That this God who is near is not just near to us in our private little bubbles locked away in our closets, but God is near in the midst of God's people. That God and our relationship with God is not something that is just a a one-on-one, two-way interaction and exchange. It is something to be lived out in the presence of all of God's people all our life long. So there it is. The one everybody knows. The 23rd Psalm. And can I tell you something odd? I've never preached on it before. It's the one everybody knows. But I wonder sometimes how many of us take it to heart. Believe it and live it. May we start doing that today. Would you pray with me? Eternal God, our shepherd, one who provides for our every need, calls us into the contentment in his love one who walks with us through the good times and even through the darkest of valleys. The one in whom we trust so deeply that we are able to sit at the table even with our enemies. If we refuse the lie of scarcity and accept your abundance, your plenty. God, that we trust in you so much mercy and goodness flow out from us as we dwell in the people of God all the days of our lives. Lord, help us to live these words that are so familiar to us. Help us, God, to not just know the words and say them from memory, but to live them with our hands and our feet, to live them in our very being of our our attitude, our expression, the way we carry ourselves with others. God, help us be people who believe the 23rd Psalm in material ways that show goodness and mercy to all around us. God, be with us now. Holy Spirit, speak to us. Lord, whatever ways you would call us to move, God, give us the strength and courage to move as we confess and believe, Lord, that you are near. Be with us now, Holy Spirit, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.